King Lear by William Shakespeare, when his character Edgar says, Child Roland to the dark tower came, his word was still. Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of a Britishman. And the poet Robert Browning wrote a poem called Child Roland to the Dark Tower Came. The word child with an E on the end means the son of a noble who is yet to win his spurs as a knight. The tale does not actually tell us how old Roland is, but we do know that he is the youngest of the children. The traditional story ends with Roland defeating the elfin king in a sword fight and rescuing his siblings. We wondered what happened next to the children of King Arthur. Tradition doesn't tell us. So we decided to use a little imagination to fill out some of the blanks. The four children of Arthur departed from the dark castle. They had three horses between them. Ellen, who had arrived at the castle by the king's elfin magic, did not have her own mount. She sat sideways behind Roland on his palfrey. A palfrey is a kind of aristocratic horse used in the Middle Ages. It does not trot, but ambles with a long, smooth step. The way home led them along a high pass between two crooked mountains. Dark clouds hung not far above them, threatening a cold drenching of rain. Ellen hung on to Roland's belt, made of metal chain that was wrapped twice around his scrawny waist. Their father's heavy sword, Excalibur, hung from the same belt, inside a scabbard studded with jewels. On his left arm, he carried a battered shield filled with dents, the marks of their father's many battles and encounters. Under the mud, grime and blood spatters, it still bore the family symbol of a dragon. Roland was even younger and more puny than his father Arthur had been when he first drew the sword from the stone. He was just 13 years old. The eldest of the brothers was called Benedict and he was the son who looked most like their father. He had the same strong brow, thick chin and blazing eyes. Naturally, he thought that their father's sword and shield belonged to him. But Roland told him, Merlin entrusted them to me and gave me the title child to denote that I shall be a knight one day. But the weapons look all wrong on you. You're too young and weak to be a knight, insisted Benedict. So, I defeated the elfin king, did I not? They rode on. They came across the stone hut of an elfin shepherd, who looked after sheep and goats. The middle brother Edmund said, Wait here, I'm going to buy some milk and cheese off this elf. But Roland rode in front of him, saying, Stop! We must not eat anything until we leave the land of the elves. I'm weak with hunger, who says we can't eat? Merlin, he gave me instructions. We must leave this land first, so the faster we go, the sooner we'll eat. At least the sun came out when they reached the lower slopes. They stopped to drink from a spring and looked enviously at the horses as they nibbled the grass without any ill effects. At night, they slept under the stars, feeling sharp hunger pains, and in the morning they rose early and continued. I'm so hungry, I'm not sure I can go on much longer, complained Edmund. How will we know when we've left the land of the elves? asked Ellen. When we start to see people who don't look like they're elves, said Roland. They rode on into the evening. All of them were weary and saddle sore. Ow, my buttocks hurt, complained Roland. Well, how do you think your horse feels carrying the two of us? asked Ellen. It was late in the evening when they rode into a village with an inn. Through the window they could see a blazing fire and people. Or were they people? Elves were not so different from humans at a distance. 
In general, they were tall and slim, with delicate skin and fine features. They often sported a mass of lustrous blonde hair. I don't care if they are elves. I'm going inside," said Edmund. "If I see another elf, I'm going to go crazy," said Ellen. Edmund dismounted from his horse, and walked on wobbly legs into the inn. The others waited, swaying in their saddles with faintness. A few minutes later, Edmund came back and said, "What are you waiting for? There are people inside, and the kitchen is working." Not an elf in sight. I've paid for four beds. Almost every muscle ached as they dismounted, tied up their horses, and walked the short distance to the door of the inn. But once they were inside, they immediately felt revived. The mixture of warmth, human chatter, and smells of food was the best medicine. The innkeeper who welcomed them was no elf. He was round and red-haired with freckles on his nose. Come in, young strangers. My daughter is preparing your room. Will you be eating before you settle down? Oh yes, we'll eat a lot," said Edmund, putting a silver coin on the bar. We're really, really hungry. We've just come from the land of the elves, where we could not eat. Added Ellen, "Land of the elves, you say? <laughs> well, young noble lords and young lady, sit down, and we'll bring you a feast fit for royalty. You can put your things down here. I'll take them upstairs for you." But when he offered to take Roland's sword and shield, the boy said, "These never leave my sight." The innkeeper, admiring the golden sword hilt. And the jeweled scabbard said, "Well, they are fine weapons, but a little unusual on one so young, if I may say so." Can we sit near the fire? Asked Ellen, who was feeling frozen. Yes, my dear, I'll move a table over for you. And while the innkeeper was doing that, Roland propped Excalibur and the shield against either side of the fireplace. One of the guests at the inn looked up from his drink and said, "If I'm not mistaken, that's the ensign of Uther Pendragon, father of King Arthur." And the eldest brother told him, "I am Benedict Pendragon, and these are my brothers and my sister." The man raised his glass as if making a toast, and then said, "You children are on the young side to be riding out alone." The forests round here are thick with bandits who will be glad to take those fine weapons off you. Thank you for the warning, but we can look after ourselves," Benedict told him. The man still could not take his eyes off the magnificent sword. Eventually, he stood up and went over to the fire to admire it closer up. He reached out to touch the hilt of Excalibur, and Roland sprang over, upsetting a tankard and spilling drink on one of the guests. Watch what you're doing. But he need not have worried. When the man's fingers touched the hilt of the sword, he recoiled. Ooh! He groaned. That fire has made it red hot. <laughs> His friends roared with laughter. <laughs> However, Roland had no trouble picking up the sword and propping it against the table where they were sitting. The innkeeper brought a hearty meal, but it turned out that the four young Pendragons could not eat as much as they had anticipated. They were so starved that their stomachs had shrunk. So they asked the innkeeper to save the leftovers for the morning. They all slept solidly, and then ate a hearty breakfast, which was served by the innkeeper's daughter. The horses were also refreshed, and they set out in a northerly direction. Taking provisions with them so that they would not be hungry on the way. After they had ridden for about half an hour, the track entered a wood. Everyone, be on your guard for bandits! Commanded Benedict, who rode on ahead to check that the way was safe. For a while, he disappeared from view. 
and then the others heard a kerfuffle, and the clash of metal. Ben's in trouble," declared Edmund, and he spurred his horse onward to help. Roland wondered what to do. His sister was riding side saddle behind him, and he knew that if he charged into the fray, she would be vulnerable to falling off or worse. Ellen, wait here," he said. "No," she protested. "I don't want to be separated from you all." "All right then," he said, drawing Excalibur from its jewelled scabbard, and he charged on ahead, only to be met by his two brothers riding full tilt back towards them with five bandits in hot pursuit. Roland held out Excalibur in front of him and yelled at the top of his voice. Excalibur crashed into the shield of the first brigand, and he went flying from his horse. Roland soon engaged the second villain in a sword fight. A third brigand tried to grab Ellen, but he leaned out too far, and seeing that he was off balance, she grabbed his sleeve and yanked him off his horse. She was not a daughter of King Arthur for nothing. Meanwhile, their two elder brothers returned to the fray. And together they saw off the bandits, who fled on horseback and foot as best they could, leaving one of their number wounded and moaning on the ground. <coughs> Ellen pulled back the visor of his helmet and saw a reddish face they all recognised, none other than their host of the previous evening, the innkeeper. Less than a minute, we'll be back to continue the story. So don't go away. First, I want to tell you about our sponsor. AI, artificial intelligence, is always in the news these days. It's all about computers doing things which we humans do, like writing stories. Well, Storybird dot AI will use AI to write a story. That features you and your favourite things, and then when it's written the story, it will read it for you and make it into a podcast episode. Ask your parents to please go to Storybird dot AI. Kids with the best stories can even win one thousand dollars. So go to Storybird dot AI to create your own podcast story. That's. Storybird dot AI. Remember Storybird. It lets you get stories just for you. And so, on with the story. They came in the night and took me prisoner. He groaned. A likely story, said Benedict. Mercy, help me! cried the innkeeper. We can't leave him here to die," said Ellen. "Oh yes, we can," said Edmund. "We'll bind his wounds and take him back to the inn," said Roland. "How?" asked Ellen. "He's not fit to ride." "We shall see," said Roland, who took a sheet out of his bag and started to cut it with his knife to make bandages. If there are any healing plants in the forest, now would be a good time to gather them," he said. "The sap from the pine trees can be good for wounds," said Ellen, who had learned many healing remedies from Merlin. "But first, we need to clean the wound." "Yeah," groaned the innkeeper, touching his jacket pocket, which it turned out contained a flask of spirit. "That will do nicely," said Ellen, who used it to clean out his wounds. <coughs> Of course, the alcohol stung dreadfully, but the pain was worth it. Then Ellen and Edmund went to collect pine sap, which they used to seal up the worst wound before binding it with the torn sheet. Merlin had taught them well, not just to inflict wounds, but to heal them up. When all was done, the innkeeper was just about strong enough to clamber onto Roland's horse. 
with some help from the boys. They walk the horse back to the inn, with many a groan and moan from the innkeeper. Occasionally, he let out a blood-curdling oath. Ah! Oh! I think he's going to live," said Ellen with a wink. When they reached the inn, Roland went inside to break the news to the innkeeper's daughter. Father! She screamed, and came running out. He was propped up by Benedict and Edmund on either side. Fortunately, there was a bedroom at the back of the inn where he could lie down without having to tackle the stairs. The boys stood outside the room. We are helping a man who tried to rob us," complained Benedict. "A true knight shows compassion, even for his enemies," declared Roland. "Well, I think we've shown enough compassion now. We should leave," said Edmund. But Ellen came out of the sick room and gave the boys a list of plants to buy in the market. She needed them for medicine: radish, bishopwort, garlic, wormwood. And hollow leak. The boys stored some of their valuables, including their shields and helmets, in their room. I feel uneasy. I don't trust this place," said Benedict as he closed the door. "Don't you remember?" asked Roland. Merlin taught us a locking spell. He took out his dagger, and with its sharp edge, he cut a lock of hair off his brother's head. He used it to tie the door latch. Only you can open it now," he said. "I hope so," said Benedict. And that was the second episode in our new series, Child Roland, which carries on where the traditional story leaves off. It was written for Story Nori by Bertie and read by me, Jana. We'll be back very soon to tell you what happened next. I can't wait, and don't forget you can support Story Nori on Patreon. From me, Jana, at StoryNori dot com. Bye for now. The Bear's Birthday Party. Hello, this is Jana, and I'm here with one of our mischievous monkey stories. In this story, you will hear that he is a real party animal. There were three things in life that the monkey liked above all else, and they were bananas, music, and tricks. This story combines all three. It was the time of year when the bear was getting ready to celebrate his birthday. He was going to be five years old, which meant that he was almost grown up. He was preparing to spend the whole day on his own, lazing on the bank of the river, with a big pile of his favourite foods. But as he stood on his hind legs collecting cherries from a tree, a little mouse asked him, "Hey, Mr. Bear, are you having a party this year?" "No." Growled the bear. Why not? Parties are fun. I had two hundred mice come to my birthday bash. Good for you, said the bear. But I don't have any friends. Oh, that's easy to solve, said the mouse. When you're throwing a party, everyone's your friend, especially if you have plenty of delicious food. And great music! Oh yeah," said the bear. "I could collect fish, nuts, and berries for my new friends, but where would I find music?" Well, you should ask the monkey," said the mouse. "He played his guitar and sang with his cousins at my birthday bash, and everyone raved all night long." He loves music so much that he would play for free. But if you pay him bananas, he will play even better. Well, I bet he would," mumbled the bear, who had no intention of asking the monkey to play music at his party. 
especially if he had to pay him. Why, he didn't even like the annoying monkey who was always playing tricks that made the bear look foolish. Nah, said the bear to the mouse. I don't think I'll have a party this year. Not in the mood. And so he scooped up all the cherries in his arms and waddled off to his cave to enjoy them on his own. But not long after he was back in his cave, his neighbour the tigress dropped by. Hey, bear, what are you doing for your birthday? Let's have a party. Nah, not in a party sort of mood. Well, get yourself into one, said the tigress. Otherwise, the word will get around that you're an old party pooper and you wouldn't want that, would you? <coughs> Growled the bear. Why should I have a party if I don't want to? It's my birthday and I can be a pooper if I want to. <coughs> the tigress purred. But you do want to have a party. You just don't know it yet, which the bear thought was a very strange thing to say. Because how could she know what the bear really wanted? Don't shake your grisly head, said the tigress. Listen up. Our friend the monkey is a real party animal. If we invite him to play the music, he won't be able to resist. We'll have free music and dancing all night. But I don't like music and dancing, protested the bear. And I like the monkey even less. <laughs> Just the thought of him makes my hair bristle. You won't regret it, said the tigress. Because as soon as the party is nearly over, I'll give the secret signal and we'll both jump on the monkey. And that will be the end of him and all our troubles. Won't that be the best birthday present you'll get this year? You've got a point, said the bear, smacking his lips at the thought of finally getting his claws on the monkey. That would be the best birthday present ever. So the bear asked the mouse to ask the monkey to play the music at his party. And the monkey agreed. Then the bear invited all the animals to his moonlight birthday bash in the clearing outside his cave. The monkey, together with his three cousins, who were in the band, built a treehouse above the cave, from where they rocked the jungle. And of course, they didn't forget to play happy birthday for the bear. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear bear. Oh, you bear. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday. Oh, you crumpy bear. All the animals were dancing and having such enormous fun that the bigger animals even forgot to eat the smaller ones, at least for the evening. But just in case anyone stood on them, the smaller animals were dancing up in the treehouse where the monkeys were playing. Meanwhile, the big beasts, like the elephant, the bear and the tigress, were stomping down on the ground making the whole jungle throb to the beat. Occasionally, the arguments broke out, such as when the hippo accused the rhino of stepping on his toes. But the bear smoothed the argument over, saying, Now, now, no quarrelling, or else I'll throw you out of my party and you'll miss all the fun. And you'll be called party poopers forevermore. Finally, as the first rosy rays of the dawn appeared in the sky behind the volcano, the monkey announced, Thank you for being such a lovely audience. For our final number, we're going to play a slow song. 
So find your favourite partner and gaze into their eyes. Hey bear, would you like to dance with me? Asked the tigress. And the bear said sleepily, All right, if you insist. And the bear began to lead the tigress round in a two-step until the bear said, Hang on, when are you going to give the secret signal to catch the monkey? Very soon. <laughs> Purred the tigress, who had been having such fun she had almost forgotten about the plan. Hmm, but first, we have to sneak up close to the monkey. So we are within pouncing distance. Then the two of them danced towards the tree where the monkeys were playing. The tigress jumped onto a lower branch and the bear pulled himself up onto another. Up and up they climbed while the monkey crooned away. Eventually they reached the tree house. There they pretended to dance together just like they were deep in love. The smaller animals all started to leave because they did not want to be trodden on. The monkey was reaching the final notes of his slow number when a little voice it was the mouse, squeaked. Encore! And all the other little animals who were leaving called out. Call! Yeah! Encore, yeah! monkey go! Yeah! I love it! Go! Immediately, the monkey and his band launched into a bouncy number with such a great beat that the tigress and the bear could not help themselves. Catch me, don't you know? I will run like a bullet from a gun. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Anytime. They started to jump up and down in time to the music. The treehouse began to shake, but they didn't notice because they were having such fun. And then the branches began to creak, but they didn't notice because the music was so loud. And then, just as the tigress was about to give the secret signal to pounce on the monkey, crash, bang, wallop, the whole dance floor collapsed and the tigress and the bear went flying with it, tumbling head over heels through the branches, snapping them on the way, until eventually they landed on the jungle floor with a great big thud. But of course, the monkeys weren't hurt at all. <laughs> Laughing hysterically, they just swung onto the nearby trees, taking their instruments with them. And the little animals had already left, so they weren't hurt either. Only the bear and the tigress were bruised and very annoyed. But the bear was most annoyed of all. In fact, he was very, very angry. Not with the monkey but with the tigress. You ruined my party. You're the worst party pooper of all time, he roared. And the tigress, seeing how angry the bear was, hobbled away as fast as her legs could carry her. And that was the bear's birthday party. Read by me, Jana for storynori.com. Drop by soon for more exciting stories. And don't forget to ask your parents or older siblings to tune in to our sister podcast for grown-ups called Relaxivity. Bye for now. Hello, this is Jana. And I am back with a story to celebrate the Chinese New Year. As you may know, each year is named after an animal. 
And this year, 2023, is the year of the rabbit. According to Chinese astrology, if you were born in the year of the rabbit, you are likely to be kind and extremely generous and be a healing sort of character. This Chinese story about the moon rabbit is often told in autumn at the time of the moon festival. But because it's the start of the new year of the rabbit, we're bringing it to you a little early. The story is known all over East Asia in various forms and is related to both Buddhist and Taoist religions. It was the night when the moon was full. Four animals, the monkey, the otter, the jackal and the rabbit got together. The monkey said, this is the night to do charity practice. The Jade Emperor has promised a great reward to the kindest animal. Well, said the Jackal, we'd better find some worthy creature to help. And may the best animal win. So the four animals went down the forest path until they found an old man sitting in front of his cave, warming his hands on the fire. He had no relatives to help him and was extremely hungry. It is our chance, said the monkey. Let's see who can help him the most. And before the others got going, he leapt into the tree to gather nuts to give to the old man. The otter hurried off to the river to catch a fish and the jackal sniffed around until he found a lizard and a pot with some rancid curd. The first three animals presented their gifts to the old man, who was extremely grateful. But the rabbit was in a quandary. He only knew how to nibble grass. And he thought a human, even a beggar, would not be very satisfied with grass. I have nothing to give, he thought sadly, as he watched the old man crunching his teeth on the lizard. The other animals have put me to shame with their generosity and kindness. And then he thought, I know. Some humans like to cook rabbits and eat them. I have an excellent gift. Myself. So having decided what he must do, he jumped into the fire. Fortunately for the rabbit, the old man wasn't actually a beggar. But he was the Jade Emperor, who had come down to earth in disguise. He was extremely impressed with the rabbit's kindness and generosity and made sure the flames did not so much as singe his fur. The Jade Emperor told the rabbit, You have won the competition, for although the other animals gave worthy gifts, yours was the greatest sacrifice of all, your own life. Therefore, I have a great honour and reward for you. You will live in a beautiful palace in the sky. There you will have a very special job. You will make medicines to cure diseases, including the elixir of life, that we immortals drink to live forever. It turned out that the palace was on the moon where he lived peacefully with the moon goddess Chang'e as her companion. So, if you look up at the moon when it is full, you will see the shape of a rabbit, his long ears and his long legs. He is standing up, working with a pestle and mortar to ground the ingredients of medicines into powder. And in autumn, at the time of the moon festival, the rabbit returns to earth and brings gifts including lanterns and moon cakes. Because the rabbit is still the kindest and most generous of animals. And that is the Chinese story of the moon rabbit to celebrate the year of the rabbit. And you might be interested to know that the moon rabbit is called Yutu in Chinese. China has sent an automatic vehicle to the moon named after the moon rabbit. It is also called Yutu. It can rove over the moon, up and down craters, and send information back to Earth about what it finds. From me, Jana, at storynori.com, wishing you prosperity.
Gung chi, phá trái. Hello, this is Jana, and welcome to Story Nori and the third episode of the Indian epic, The Ramayana. In a moment, I'll be continuing the story with two new voices, my sister cousins, Parveen and Elizabeth. This episode features plenty of palace plotting and intrigue. But first, I'm going to give you a little reminder about the characters. King Dashratha of Ayodhya had three wives. Kausalya, the eldest most revered wife and mother of Rama. Sumitra, the mother of the twins Lakshmana and Shatrughna. And Queen Kakei, the youngest queen and mother of Bharata. All four sons of the wives have a little of the god Vishnu in them, but Rama has the most and is therefore the most godlike of the brothers. In the previous episode, Rama married Princess Sita and returned with her to the kingdom of Ayodhya. Some time later, his brother Bharata left the palace to visit his relatives in another kingdom. So now let's continue with the story, which introduces a new character to the plot. Mantra, a servant loyal to Queen Kakei, mounted the stairs of the royal palace rising like the moon. As she climbed, she could hear drums and musical instruments, and her nostrils were filled with the buttery scent of sandalwood. When she reached the flat rooftop, she paused to catch her breath before gazing out over the city of Ayodhya, which that evening was more splendid than ever. For the past few days, workers had been scrubbing the stones of the royal streets until they dazzled in the sunlight. And now the soldiers in bright uniforms were lining the pavements and crowds were gathering behind them. Mantra was not alone on the rooftop. Another servant, a nurse, was also taking in the view. Her eyes goggled with delight. Mantra turned to the nurse and asked, Why is the whole city getting ready to celebrate? Is Rama's mother going to throw gold and silver coins to the masses? The people are hanging around the streets as if they expect some sort of free gift. And the nurse gushed out. Oh, haven't you heard the joyous news? King Dashratha is about to appoint his son, Prince Rama, as the new king. All the people are celebrating because they love Prince Rama, who is a tiger among men. And as you rightly say, Queen Kausalya, who has kindness in her soul, has promised to give money to the people. The news was anything but joyous to Mantra. She turned up her nose and said, <laughs> Well, that explains it. No wonder Rama's mother is in such a generous mood. Her son will soon be kin. She can afford to give away money now. And then she added under her breath, Unless I can prevent this happening. And then she gathered up her skirts and left hastily, descending the stairs and heading straight for the chamber of Queen Kaikei, the mother of Prince Bharata. There the servant spoke to the queen as follows. You foolish woman! What are you doing lounging around as if nothing important is happening? Don't you realise that grief and misfortune are coming for you? Why aren't you begging your husband to see sense? Has your face lost its beauty? Have you forgotten how to use your charms? Don't you see your last chance to save yourself from ruin? The queen, who had been resting on her couch, tried to soothe her distraught servant, speaking gently. Oh, Mantra, Mantra, what's upsetting you? Now you can tell me what's troubling you. You know I'll always look after you. Mantra took a deep breath and steadied herself before explaining, Your Majesty, do not think I am worried on my own account. What happens to me is of no consequence. It is your fate that is concerning me. The whole city is celebrating. 
celebrating because Dashratha is about to name Rama as the next king. Kaikei laughed with relief. My dear, is that all that is troubling you? This is far from terrible news. It is a case for happiness. For Rama is the best of men. His gurus have taught him well. He knows right from wrong and I love him just as much as my own son, Bharata. A look of astonishment and disbelief passed over Mantra's face as her eyes widened and her mouth gaped. She began to shed hot tears as she implored Kaikei. My queen, my queen, you think that way because you are too innocent and do not know the ways of the world. Do you not see how Korsalia envies your youth and beauty? Do you not realise how she longs to take her revenge on you? As soon as her son is king, she will have all the power and she will make her move. She will banish you or have you killed. The best you can hope for is to stay in the palace as her servant. Oh, what a sneaky old devil the king is, don't you see? He sent your son, Bharata, packing as soon as he was safely out of the way. She picked Rama to be the next king. How can you, my dear, lovely heart, hope to keep up with such tricks? He pretends to love you. But really, he is like a viper in your bosom. So wake up. Now is the time to save yourself. Finally, the young queen began to see why Mantra was so agitated. She got up from the couch and took a jewel from her hair, which she then gave to her servant. And then, trembling, she asked, Oh, Mantra, It is true you are loyal and have my welfare at heart. But what can I do to avoid this terrible fate coming to pass? What you must do, my dear, is this. You must go straight to the chamber of the king. Hurry, do not waste any time. There you must wait for him. When he arrives, he must find you tearing your hair out and sobbing your eyes out. He will pity you. He will not be able to help himself as he is weak and foolish old man. You are his most darling young queen. He would go through fire for your sake. He would give his own life for you. Then use your beauty. Look up at him with your big eyes. Remind him of the time he promised you two favours. Do you recall? He was wounded in battle and you nursed him back to health. He was so grateful that he promised you anything you wanted twice over. Well, now is the time to call the favours in. He cannot refuse For he is a foolish but honest man. He cannot break a promise. Tell him that for the first favour, he must banish Rama to the forest for nine years. Then for the second, he must announce that your son, Bharata, shall be king. Do you understand what you must do? Ah, yes, Mantra. I understand what I must do, said the queen to her servant. So she immediately left her chamber and hurried along to King Dashratha's rooms. Just as Mantra had said, while the young queen waited for Dashratha, she messed up her hair and rubbed her eyes until they were red. When the kindly king came into his rooms, He found her lying on the floor, beating her fists up and down and kicking her feet in the air. What is the matter, my dear? He asked, picking her up and stroking her hand. I can't understand why you should be so upset. Are you unwell? Shall I call a doctor? 
The queen turned to him, and he wiped the tears off her face with a silk scarf, until eventually she said, "In my whole life, nobody has treated me with so much disrespect as you have done." What, my dear? How can you say such a thing? Save for Rama, there is nobody in the whole wide world that I love as much as you. I will do anything to make you happy. Well, if you really love me and don't just pretend, you recall how after I nursed your battle wounds and brought you back to health, you offered me two favors. I do so recall. And you agreed that I could save those favors until I needed them.、Mm, certainly, my dear. Well, at least you haven't forgotten. So now I need you to keep your promise, as guaranteed by holy law. If you truly are a man of honor, as the people say you are, you will not break your word. Of course, you only have to say what you want, and it shall be so. Do you swear by Indra, and all the gods, and the sun, and the moon, and the earth, and all the stars that you will keep your word for me? I do. Oh, good. This is what I require. Listen carefully and do not falter. First, banish Rama to the forest for nine years, and second, announce to the people that my son Paratha shall be king in his place. It was hard for King Dashratha to take in these words. Was this a joke? Was she about to giggle and say that she was just testing him? And of course, all she really wanted was a box of jewels, or a baby elephant, or a gallon of perfume. He half smiled at the thought and said, "My dear, you know, I can't do that." And she flashed back at him with eyes blazing. So you aren't a man of honor, and you don't love me, and you don't keep your promises. You're just a fake, an actor, a hypocrite, King. No, my dear, I am a man of my word, but it is wrong of you to ask this of me. No, it isn't. You promised me that I could have anything I wanted, and this is what I want. In fact. I demand that you keep your solemn oath that you gave me just a minute ago. The king could bear this no longer. With tears soaking his old cheeks, he left his scheming youngest wife, and went to his eldest queen, Kausalya, the mother of Rama. Dear, most respected wife. Something terrible has happened, as you know. I intended to anoint our son Rama as my successor later today, but now the youngest queen has called in her two favors that I granted her some time ago. She demands that I send Rama to the forest and declare that her son is king. Vile woman. Now I see her for what she is—a viper in the nest. If I keep my word to her, as per holy law, I will be guilty of another crime: sending our noble son to the forest. There is no way to win. I only have two ways to lose. What must I do? And Kausalya told him that he must follow the holy law. And his conscience. So he consulted the wise men and seers, and the way was clear to him. He must keep his promise to his youngest wife, and banish Rama to the forest for nine years. While announcing her son as successor, and therefore he had no choice but to call Rama to his chambers, and give him the terrible news. He sent his charioteer to fetch Rama, who was with his friends preparing for the coronation. He hastily returned to the palace to meet his mother and father. Immediately he entered the room, he saw his father's face was looking ill, and his lip was trembling. He was unable to speak. 
Father, what have I done to cause you such displeasure? Asked Rama. His father was unable to speak, and so his mother spoke in his place. Dear son, you have done nothing wrong, but your father is overcome with grief. You are so dear to him that his lips cannot tell you what has happened. Today was supposed to be a day of rejoicing. He woke up this morning intending to announce that you are to be his successor, the next king. But before he could put his plans into action, Queen Kaikei came to him and asked that he grant her two favours that he promised her long ago. He, innocent man that he is, expected her to ask for playthings or jewels or clothes or perhaps a pet bird. But she showed her true colours and made an evil demand that you, dear Rama, tiger among men, be banished to the forest for nine years. For her second favour, she insisted that her son, your brother Bharata, be made king in your place. This is why your father cannot speak. He is struck dumb with grief. He has begged his wise men to find a way out of this dilemma, but they cannot. Holy Law demands that he keep his word, and so now he must banish you, his dear son, to the forest. Rama was not angry. He did not argue. He did not curse the younger queen who had deprived him of his kinship. Instead, he said, The way is clear. My father must keep his word. For his sake, I shall gladly obey and retire to the forest. And I have no concerns. My brother Bharata is noble and pure of heart. He will make an excellent king. My only concern is for my wife Sita, who will be lost without me. Mother, you must take care of her while I am away. I shall, my son, said his mother. I promise to look after Sita as if she were my own daughter. And without any further ado, Rama left calmly and peacefully to return to his quarters and prepare for his journey into the forest. And that was the third part of the Indian epic, the Ramayana. And thank you to my sister cousins, Parveen and Elizabeth, for taking part. We will be back soon to follow the fate of Rama and his beloved wife Sita. And if you like stories of a spiritual nature, you can tune in to our other podcast, Relaxivity, which is like Story Nori, but for grown-ups. The stories are relaxing and fascinating at the same time, and sometimes are slightly more mature than Story Nori. For now, from me Jana, see you soon.
The Cat Who Wanted to Be a Monkey. Hello, this is Jana, and I'm here with two of our popular monkey stories. If you've heard any of them before, you will know that they are small, cheeky, and sweet, just like monkeys. And just in case you are waiting for the Ramayana, we'll be back soon with our epic serial. The first of our stories is called "The Cat Who Wanted to Be a Monkey." Once upon a time, Mother Bushcat, Father Bushcat, and Baby Bushcat were watching the monkey playing. They saw how he drank flower nectar, ate fruit, picked fleas from his friend's fur, and swung through the trees, shrieking and chattering. Indeed, he was a very noisy monkey, and best known for his naughty tricks. It's all right for some," said Mother Bushcat, after picking up Baby Bushcat for the fifteenth time that day, and putting him back in their den. Yes, monkeys lead a very easy life," said Father Bushcat, as he stretched and yawned. And then Baby Bushcat piped up, "Mummy." Can I be a monkey some day when I grow up? Mother Bushcat laughed and said, "Oh, how you wish you were a monkey! But no, dear, you were born a bushcat, and you will always be a bushcat. That's the law of the jungle." Meow! Oh, that's not fair! Meow! Protested Baby Bushcat. I'm sure the monkey. Monkeys would really like me to join them if I asked them nicely. Brrr. Well, you can try, dear, and see what happens," said Mother Bushcat, who was sure that her baby would soon forget about his idea to become a monkey. But Baby Bushcat did not forget his ambition to become a monkey, and as soon as he was old enough to prowl out and about on his own, under strict instructions not to stray far. And to come back before dark, he set out to find the place where the monkeys were playing. Sure enough, he soon found a monkey sitting with his back to a banana tree. Meow, Mister Monkey, I'm Baby Bushcat. Pleased to meet you. Likewise, Baby Bushcat," said the monkey as he peeled a banana. I've seen you play. And I'd like to be a monkey too, if I can, please," said Baby Bushcat. "Well, now, it's no easy matter for the Baby Bushcat to grow up into a monkey," said the monkey. "No, please let me be a monkey, please. I really, really want to be a monkey, and I'll never forget you if you help me. And I'll always pick your fleas whenever you ask me." All right then," said the monkey. "We monkeys like enthusiasm. If you really want to be a monkey first, you must learn to scratch my back. I've got an itch just in the middle, but mind you are not too sharp with your claws." Baby Bushcat scratched the monkey's back, and the monkey said, "Ah." Just right. Meow. Great. Can I be a monkey now? Hold on. Hold on. Not just yet. Next, you must learn to harvest the bananas. Climb up into that tree and get me a few. Right away, the cat sprung up into the tree and cut down six bananas with his claw. And then he jumped down onto the forest floor and said, mm, "I've done it! I've cut down some bananas. Now can I be a monkey? Meow! Please, please! Hold on, hold on! Not just yet. We've got to sort out that tail of yours first. Meow! What's wrong with my tail? I've got a good tail, haven't I?" Yeah, it's an okay tail for a baby bushcat, but it isn't long enough for a monkey. 
So what can I do? Hold on a minute. I'll help you, replied the monkey, who got up and began to pull Baby Bushcat's tail. Meow! Ooh, that hurts! Meow! said Baby Bushcat. Is it long enough yet? Mm, not yet, but I'll tell you what. I'll just tie your tail to this branch and that will do the trick. Meow! Tie my tail to a branch? I don't want you to tie my tail to a branch. Please, meow, please don't do that. Hold on a minute. I thought you said you wanted me to help you to become a monkey. Meow, I did. Well then. Just let me tie your tail to this branch, and before too long, you'll be one. Brrr, all right then. I suppose if you have to. And so the baby bush cat let the monkey tie his tail to a branch of the banana tree. The monkey used some vines to tie him by a strong monkey knot, and then stood back to admire baby bush cat who was now swinging upside down from the branch, almost like monkeys do. Can I be a monkey, please? Baby Bushcat asked as he swung there by his tail. Aha! I monkey tricked you! Called out the monkey as he flew off through the trees laughing to himself at the wonderful trick he had played on the baby Bushcat who was now left meowing and crying for his mummy. To tell you the truth, it was a very mean trick of the monkey to play on the baby Bushcat. Now Baby Bushcat's tail was really starting to hurt, and he started to sob. Meow, oh, I want my mummy! Meow, 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 I don't want to be a monkey anymore! Boom, meow! Eventually Mother Bushcat came out to find him, and she bit through the vines and let him down. Who tied your tail to that branch? she asked. And Baby Bushcat sobbed. The monkey, meow, the monkey did it. Do you still want to be a monkey? No, I don't, because monkeys play mean tricks. Meow. Well, you've learnt a very good lesson today, said Mother Bushcat. And from that day on, Baby Bushcat wanted to grow up to be a bushcat, just like Father Bushcat which he did, and when he had his own babies, he told them to watch the monkeys and laugh at them, and never, ever try to be one. And that was the story of the cat who wanted to be a monkey. In a moment, I'm going to tell you another monkey story. This one's called The Monkey Who Wanted to Fly. But first, let's hear from this week's sponsor, Wondery. Grown-ups, if your kids asked you how fast a peregrine falcon can fly, would you know the answer? 10 miles per hour? Maybe 25? 50? Well, in fact, the correct answer is 200 miles per hour. I know this because we've been listening to Flip and Mosey's guide to how to be an earthling. Flip and Mosey are exploring Earth and meeting animals from all around the world. One of our favourite travel pods from last season was when Flip and Mosey went swimming in the very chilly Arctic Ocean to meet a 250-year-old bowhead whale. But she's not as old as Mosey, who is turning 900 years old. Flip and Mosey's guide features songs the whole family will love, written and composed by the pop-ups three-time Grammy-nominated children's artists. This holiday taking an adventure is as simple as pressing play on an episode of Flip and Mosey's Guide to How to Be an Earthling. Listen to new episodes of How to Be an Earthling on Thursdays, wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen early and ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. And now... On with our next story, which is called The Monkey Who Wanted to Fly. 
Now, as you know, the monkey was always playing tricks on the other animals. I've already told you about the time that he tied Baby Bushcat to a tree by his tail, and he was always catching the other animals by surprise, making them jump with a sudden shriek, or sneaking up when they were asleep, and pulling their noses. He thought that his tricks were very, very funny, but the other animals found him very, very annoying. And the biggest and proudest beast, like the bear, the tiger, and the eagle, were most annoyed with him of all. <coughs> Said the bear, well, "I wish I could bear punch him, but he's too fast and he always dodges." <coughs> Said the tiger, "I wish I could bite his cheeky head off, but he won't hang around long enough for me to eat him." And then the eagle, who was the king of the birds, said, "Quack, quack, quack! I'd like to pick him up by the scruff of his neck, fly high into the sky, and drop him into the ocean." Mmm, what a delight, fly dear! Heard the tiger. Oh, I like the way you think," said the bear. "Why don't you do it? It will be a service to animal kind." I would," said the eagle. "But he hides in the trees, where the branches are too thick for me to swoop down and catch him." And the bear, the tiger, and the eagle grumbled amongst themselves that nobody would ever catch that monkey, and he would carry on playing annoying tricks. Until the end of time. Now a little mouse happened to be listening to the conversation of the three big beasts, and he squeaked up. Excuse me, sirs, if you don't mind me suggesting, but if you want to catch a trickster, you have to play a trick. Oh, oh that's right. He's got a point there," said the bear.、Mm, but what trick can we play? Asked the tiger. Remember, he knows all the tricks. Because he's playing them already," said the eagle. "I know. I have an idea," said the mouse, and he told them his plan, which the three big beasts thought was a super smart idea, and ordered the other animals and birds to put into action. The eagle announced that for one day only, he was willing to take any animal who wanted up into the air for free to experience what it felt like to fly, and he promised. Not to eat them. Normally, none of the other animals would have agreed to try anything like that, because the idea of flying can be very frightening, unless you are a bird, of course. But the bear and the tiger ordered the smaller animals, including the gerbil and the tortoise and the bush cat, to queue up and wait for their turn to go flying. As promised, the eagle picked each one of them up, soared into the air. And returned them safely to the ground. The smaller animals reported that flying was a bit sick-making, but very thrilling. And they were so happy to be alive when they returned that they did a little dance and told everyone else that they should try it too. Now the monkey saw the animals go up into the air and return safely. And eventually, he could not resist. The opportunity to experience what it was like to fly, so he stepped forward and said, "Can I have a go?" "Well done, monkey. That's a good fellow," roared the tiger. "That will be a thrill of a lifetime. I wish I could go up, but I'm too heavy to fly. Now you're just the right size, and you'll love it." And then the monkey clung for dear life. To the eagle's legs, as the bird's great wings soared across the warm air currents, over the tops of the trees, and out above the waves of the ocean. Uh, uh, I feel sick. Can we go back now, please? Asked the monkey. Wow! Shrek you! Called back the eagle, who started to swoop this way and that, until the monkey was so dizzy he would not hold on any more. And he fell down into the sea as the eagle called out, "Bombs away!" Now that would have been the end of the monkey. But it so happened that a fisherman caught the monkey in his net and hauled him on board, 
the monkey was the strangest fish he had ever seen. And the monkey soon shot up to the top of the boat's mast, where he sat above the sail like a lookout, until they reached the shoreline where he hopped into the branches of a nearby tree. The eagle returned to the spot where he had left the other animals and declared, Mission accomplished! I dropped the cargo into the ocean waves. The monkey has tripped his last. But no sooner had he spoken than the monkey called out from a nearby tree. Ha ha! Tricked you! And the three big beasts jumped into the air with shock. Thanks for taking me flying, called out the monkey. I didn't ask to go swimming, but that was fun too. <laughs> See you soon for another funny trick. <laughs> Growled the tiger at the eagle. Mission accomplished, you said. Total failure, more like. And the eagle saw how angry the tiger and the bear were and decided to fly back to his nest on top of a craggy mountain. And that was the story of the monkey who wanted to fly. I do hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back soon with another episode of the Ramayana here at storynori.com. For now, from me Jana, see you soon. The Ramayana, Part 2 Hello, this is Jana, and welcome to Story Nori. I am back with the second part of our Indian epic, the Ramayana. And before I start, I would like to thank Gaius, Clement and Lucia, who support us on Patreon. If you'd like to help us, you can donate as little as $5 per month at patreon.com forward slash story nori. In the first episode, we heard how a holy man Vishwamitra was being harassed by evil demons every time he tried to meditate and pray. He asked King Dashratha for the help of his son Rama and his brother Lakshmana. Rama fought the demons and killed them. Vishwamitra led the two boys, Rama and his brother Lakshmana, out of the forest. Rama strode along like a tiger. He had broad shoulders, powerful long arms, and his hands were as strong as diamonds. Most remarkable of all, his skin was sky blue, like the god Vishnu, because of course, part of Vishnu was in him. His loyal brother Lakshmana had a complexion like gold and a head full of curly hair. They were heading for the kingdom of Mithila, in the Himalayan mountains, where Janaka was king. King Janaka owned a remarkable weapon, the magnificent bow of Shiva. One time, the gods refused to share a sacrifice with Shiva. In anger, he picked up the bow and rushed at his fellow gods, meaning to kill them with it. Seeing his anger, the other gods began to sing hymns in praise of Shiva, just in the nick of time because their voices calmed Shiva and soothed his temper. They persuaded Shiva to lay down the bow and he gave it to a mortal man who was king of Mithila. He was Janaka's ancestor and the bow has come down to Janaka. The divine weapon was incredibly powerful and indeed an arrow fired from it could destroy an entire city. But it was so strong that no human had been able to string it, let alone load an arrow and fire it. King Janaka offered the hand in marriage of his daughter, Princess Sita, to any man who could string the bow. Sita was a remarkable young woman. The earth had given birth to her. And King Janaka had found her in a ploughed field. Many kings and princes had tried to string the bow, and all had failed. When Vishwamitra had told the story, he said, Rama, 
Shall we see if you can succeed where others have failed? Why not? And so they walked on, higher and higher into the Himalayan mountains and the city of Mithila, which was in the country we now call Nepal. King Janaka met them at the break of day. He knelt down at the feet of Vishvamitra and pressed his hands together with the fingers pointing upwards. Vishvamitra, you are famed as one of the wisest rishis on earth, a living saint. I am greatly honoured by your visit. Command me, and I shall obey. You are known throughout the three worlds as a righteous king who follows the way of holy law. Dharma, I thank you for your hospitality. The gods have rewarded you with the divine bow of Shiva. We have heard how you have promised the hand in marriage of your daughter, Sita, to the first man who can string the bow. We have come to take up the challenge. Let me introduce you to the noble sons of King Dasrata, the lotus-eyed Prince Rama and the trusty Prince Lakshmana. Let us see if Prince Rama can lift the mighty bow and string it. If that is your wish, Visvamitra, of course I shall do exactly as you desire. But first, I must tell you that many kings and princes have tried their hands at the bow, and not one has been able to lift it out of its box, let alone string it. Many of them have been frustrated and angry. That is exactly as I have heard, and I do not doubt that no mortal man has been able to lift the bow so far. But I am curious to see if Prince Rama can succeed where others have failed, and I assure you, if he may succeed or fail, there will be no anger or frustration. I am a man of my word. I shall do exactly as you have commanded. It is my honour to obey a man who is so famed for his wisdom and holiness. And so King Jonica ordered preparations to be made for the trial of the bow. On the appointed day, crowds of nobles, holy men and ordinary folk gathered in the fields before the palace. The bow was kept in an iron chest on eight wheels, garlanded with flowers and scented with perfumes. It was so heavy that it took many men to haul the chest out while musicians played and women danced. Rama stepped down from the platform and strolled over to the iron chest. He peered inside and saw the magnificent bow of Shiva, with its many wonderful carvings and decorations. He reached inside the chest with one arm and lifted up the bow as if it was as light as a reed. Then, holding it with his foot, he bent the bow to string it. The crowd fell silent and gazed as he steadily pulled the top of the bow towards him until all of a sudden it snapped in two with a crack as loud as thunder. And the whole palace and the pavilion shook. People ducked and hid, some fainted and others ran away. Only Vishwamitra, King Janaka Lakshmana and of course Rama himself did not flinch. After some time, when the earth stopped trembling and people had a chance to come to their senses, King Janaka sent ambassadors in swift chariots to Rama's father, King Dashrata in Ayodhya, to ask his permission for the marriage and to invite him to come as soon as possible to Mithila. The ambassadors arrived with their horses exhausted by the great rush. The chief ambassador knelt before King Dashrata with his hands pressed together and said, 
King Janaka of Mithila, delight of his people, sends you greetings and asks after your health. He wishes you to know that your son, the lotus-eyed Prince Rama, has succeeded in breaking the divine bow of Shiva and has won the hand of his daughter, Princess Sita. He asks for your permission for your son to marry Sita. King Dashrata immediately made preparations to travel to Mithila for the wedding. He sent priests ahead of him, escorted by soldiers with rich gifts of treasure. He himself set off with his army. Soldiers carried the king in a golden palanquin. When they arrived, they were greeted by King Janaka, and preparations were made for the magnificent wedding. The streets are filled with sweet-sung songs that charm the ears and joyful tears and cheers of delight, clattering of hooves, trumpets of elephant's might. Flowers are strewn across the way and merchants put out their rich displays. Women dance and rishis trance, soldiers drill and spectators thrill. All are ready for the great celebration. All await holy vows of affirmation. Rama readies himself by fasting and fixing his soul on the everlasting. His head is shaved according to the way that the gods decreed for this wedding day. His brother Lakshmana is to be married too, to Sita's sister, who is beautiful, kind and true. And then the ceremony begins. Rama, this is my daughter Sita. Take her hand. I hold your hand according to Dhamma. We are husband and wife. Lakshmana, this is my daughter Urmila. Take her hand. Urmila, I hold your hand according to Dharma. We are husband and and wife. Three times Rama and Sita circled the sacred flame, and Lakshmana and his bride do the same. Then celestial drums sound out on high, and blossoms fall down from the cloudless sky. Joyous cheers sound across the land, mingled with music from the wedding bands. celebrations had finally come to a close, Vishwamitra announced that he had accomplished all he wished for and took his leave, heading for the higher up slopes of the Himalayan mountains where he could contemplate in solitude. It was also time for King Dashratha to return to Ayodhya with his sons and their new wives. Before they departed, King Janaka gave the newlyweds many rich gifts, including horses, chariots, and many of the finest cows. Finally, they set out on the way. But the journey home was not uneventful. Along the road out of Mithila, they heard birds shrieking terribly, and the sun went dark. King Dashratha asked his family priest, Vasistha, what was the meaning of the dreadful sounds? And the priest replied, Something terrible is about to happen. But do not trouble yourself because it will end well. And his wise words were soon proven to be correct. The road ahead caught fire and a huge mountain of a man stepped out of the flames with an axe slung over his shoulder and his hands holding a bow, very like the one that Rama had broken. 
King Dashratha's men fell to the ground unconscious. Only the king, his family and his priests were left standing. The family priest, Vasistha, recognised the terrifying figure as Parashurama, or the Rama with an axe. Like Rama, he was an avatar of the god Vishnu. An avatar has the form of a human being, and at the same time represents a god on earth. The god Shiva had taught Parashurama the art of war, and had given him an axe and a bow which he always carried with him. He was not shy to use his weapons of war. He caused so much death and destruction that the god Indra made him vow to put down his weapons and lead a life of peace. It seemed that he had forgotten his promise. King Dashratha's son Rama stepped forward and spoke to Rama with an axe. He chose his words carefully so as to soothe the fierce warrior. As he spoke, he held his hands together in a respectful greeting. Mighty Parashurama, Namaste, he said. I am most highly honoured to meet you. Your wish is my command. Prince Rama, I saw how you broke the mighty bow of Shiva. Now you think you're stronger than anyone else on earth? <laughs> A real tough guy, aren't you? Well, I've got news for you. That bow was ready to snap. It spent a thousand years inside a rusty old box. The rain got to it and rotted it. Well, as it happens, I have one just like it. Another bow given by mighty Shiva. And now I present this bow to you, for you to use as a replacement. Thank you for this wonderful gift, said Rama. <laughs> You're welcome. And here's what you can do for me in return. We shall fight a duel to the death and see who is the strongest. You with the bow or me with the axe? If you are as strong as you think you are, you will be able to string that bow in a second or two and shoot me before I can get near you with my axe. But somehow I don't feel afraid. I don't think you have the strength. I think you are a weakling. Now let us both try our luck and see if I am correct. Parashurama, if a duel to the death is what you wish for, then I cannot refuse your request, said Rama. But as soon as he spoke these words, King Dashratha was filled with fear for the life of his beloved son. Raising his hands and trembling, he cried, Honoured Parashurama, do not think of fighting or killing. I've heard you made a promise to Thousand-Eyed Indra to put aside your weapons. So keep to your word, I say. If you were to kill Rama, you would be killing me too. And all of us, because we cannot live without him. There is no need for such a terrible trial of strength. Think of harmony on earth and the gods in heaven. And, above all, remember your vow of peace. But the Rama with an axe took no notice of the king, and still addressing Prince Rama, said, this bow is divine, without equal. Its arrows are powerful enough to destroy cities. How could you not want to try it? Though I doubt that you have the strength to use it. But when Parashurama saw Rama pull the impossibly powerful bow back to his head and take aim, he realised that he had made a terrible mistake. He began to tremble and say, Rama, please do not destroy me altogether. Allow me the freedom to travel to the mountains and live as a hermit. I will never be violent again. I give my word. Rama replied, I will not kill you with this arrow, though I do have the power to do so. This arrow will drive the arrogance out of you once and for all. 
with a mighty earth-shattering twang, the arrow flew from the bow of Shiva, striking Parashurama and sending him flying to the Mahendra Mountains in the east, where he landed with a shuddering thud. He was no longer the Rama with an axe, because he dropped his mighty weapon. He was shaken to the core, and heaven was barred to him for breaking his vow of peace. But now at last, he began to lead a blameless life of contemplation. Then Rama, with the bow of Shiva in his hand, prayed to the gods to thank them for his gift and victory. When the wedding party reached Ayodhya, Rama and his brothers and their brides were greeted by the three wives of King Dashratha and welcomed into the family, and all of them lived blissfully, enjoying the beautiful surroundings, friends and each other. Rama and Sita grew more and more in love. With each passing year, he became more godlike, and she more and more resembled a goddess. After some time had passed, King Dashratha summoned Rama's brother, Prince Bharat. He told him that his uncle had arrived from the kingdom of Kakeya, where his mother had been born. He wished him to visit his relatives at home. Prince Bharat readily agreed to do as his father wished. Bharat set out with his uncle on his journey. His mother, Queen Kakei, was naturally sad to be parted from her son but she was also happy for him to visit her relatives. She did not think it was anything other than a normal family visit, until one of her servants came to her and told her to be worried. And if you would like to find out what the servant told Queen Kakai, tune in soon to Story Nori's version of the Ramayana. We are going to finish the show by telling you about a few of the Hindu gods, but first... Let's hear from our sponsor, Wandery. Grown-ups, if your kids asked you how long a camel can go without water, would you know the answer? A day? A week? A month? Well, in fact, the correct answer is two weeks. I know this because we've been listening to Flip and Mosey's guide to how to be an earthling. Flip and Mosey are exploring Earth and meeting animals from all around the world. One of our favourite travel pods from last season was when Flip and Mosey visited the Philippines. Flip climbed into a tree to meet a paradise tree snake which showed off how he could fly. Flip tried to fly too with hilarious results. Flip and Mosey's guide features songs the whole family will love written and composed by the Pop-Ups, three-time Grammy-nominated children's artists. This holiday, taking an adventure is as simple as pressing play on an episode of Flip and Mosey's Guide to How to Be an Earthling. Listen to new episodes of How to Be an Earthling on Thursdays, wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen early and ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wandry app. We really hope you are enjoying Story Nori's Ramayana. And if you are not familiar with the Hindu gods, here's a little guide. Brahma is the creator of the universe and is often shown with four faces and four arms. Vishnu is the preserver of the universe. He's often shown with blue skin and four arms and he takes on many human forms or avatars including Rama, Krishna and and Buddha. Shiva is the destroyer of the universe. He reaps a kind of creative destruction. Because without destruction, there can be no rebirth. Do tune in soon to Story Nori to continue with this Indian epic. And I would very much like to thank Gaius, Clement and Lucia for supporting Story Nori on Patreon. Their father writes... I just wanted to thank you for all the wonderful audio stories. My three young children love them. Story Nori is just the type of resource I was looking for. Audio stories like books require much more active attention than video and I think such active listening is great for children. You too can support us for as little as $5 per month at patreon.com 
forward slash story nori or look for the link in the sidebar of storynori.com. The Ramayana is adapted by Story Nori's Bertie and read by me, Jana. It features the voices of Bertie and Tom Ferrance. And just as a reminder, we have another podcast called Relaxivity. It is aimed at teenagers and adults and features audio of a spiritual and calming nature. And now I'm going to play you out with a Hindu prayer to the Lord of the Universe. I think you will find the words of universal appeal. For now, from me, Jana, see you soon. Om Om
the Ramayana. Hello, this is Jana, and I'd like to wish you all a very happy Diwali, which, in case you don't know, is the Hindu festival of light. It celebrates the triumph of light over darkness, and good over evil. And for Diwali this autumn, we are starting our version of the Indian epic, the Ramayana. We will feature the voices of Tom Ferrance and Bertie. Chapter One: The Gods Have a Problem. Deep in a dark forest of India, a holy man was hovering slightly off the ground, just above the carpet of leaves. This wise man, known in the ancient Indian language of Sanskrit as a rishi, had once been a king, wealthy and powerful. In old age, he went without food, company, and sleep. After depriving his body and focusing his mind for many years, he had achieved the power of levitation. And as he sat deep in a trance. His body rose into the air. He was not without an audience. Agni, the bright god of the flames, flickered and danced before him. The eyes of animals and birds glinted like stars among the trees as they watched him perform the miracle of mind over matter. His low chant carried. Throughout the wood, may all parts of my body, including those of speech, life, vision, hearing, become strong. By being close to Brahman, let there be peace in me. Let there be peace around me. Peace be to the world. Peace to the world. Peace to the world. The mantra was pleasing to the divine ears of the gods, and brought harmony to the world. But the chanting sage annoyed some of his neighbors in the forest. His endlessly repeating voice did nothing to soothe them. In fact, it grated on their nerves. These enemies of harmony were demons, known in Sanskrit as Rakshasas. One was Dadaga, a princess reborn as a winged monster. She had the face of a woman, but her body was feathered. And her hands and feet were clawed. She was determined to hinder the holy man, and she summoned her sons Maricha and Subahu to help her out with her tricks. The trio of demons flew at the floating sage, screeching in his face and chucking dirt and blood at his body. Dadaka, terrible though she was, would not have dared insult the holy man and the gods without a powerful protector. She felt safe to misbehave because she served Ravana, the king of the Rakshasas, who at that time had gained great power. King Ravana was terrible to look at. He had ten heads, twenty hands, and a chest as broad as a mountain. From his island kingdom of Lanka, he sent out agents of disruption and destruction. His aim was to stamp out holiness and harmony. Disharmony was his delight. The clashing clamor of conflict was his music. Long ago, he had pretended to be a saint. He went without food and finery. Brahma, the grandfather of the gods, was pleased and offered him a reward. Ravana asked to be made invulnerable so that no god. Nor demon could kill him. Brahma granted him this boon, but as soon as he gained great power, Ravana revealed his evil side, and brought chaos into the world. Then it was too late. No god could stand in his way, as you might imagine. 
the gods were unhappy with this state of affairs. In heaven, they held a council of complaint. Indra, king of skies and weather, took the lead in speaking out. Lord Brahma, you have created a heavy problem for us, even though you did not mean to. Wherever rishis do us honor, Ravana, the arrogant king of Lanka, sends his fiends to frustrate them. There is nothing we can do because you made him invulnerable to our power. The grandfather of the gods shook his hair as white as a swan and replied, Indra, I hear what you say. Yes, it is true that Ravana is the most powerful Rakshasa that the universe has seen. Yes, it is true that in his presence the sun is afraid to shine, the winds are terrified to blow, and the sea dares not show a ripple on her face. But listen to this. I left a chink in his armor. A being so powerful was too arrogant to seek protection from mere humans. This is what we must do. We must send a man to kill him. This reply greatly surprised Indra, whose whole body flashed with lightning as he thundered back. Bah! If we sent an army of one million puny humans against Ravana, he would just laugh. He would uproot a mountain and hurl it at our heads. While these gods were in uproar, divine Vishnu, his sky-blue skin wrapped in his blazing saffron robe, rode up to the council on his eagle, looking like the sun upon a cloud. The council quietened, because the gods wanted to hear what he had to say. O oh Brahma, our revered grandfather, you seek a human to destroy the evil Ravana. Permit me to be born to a human mother, and I will complete this deed of destiny. Grandfather Brahma was pleased with this positive response, but he cautioned as follows. Lord Vishnu, your power is too great for one human woman's body to bear. Let your spirit be divided among three mothers. I know how you must achieve this. In the blessed kingdom of Ayodhya, the virtuous king Dasata has three wives, and as yet, not a single son. Allow yourself to be born to all three wives, but not in equal parts. And, when the time is right, you may bring peace to the three worlds by defeating the evil Rakshasa king. It shall be so replied the shining Lord Vishnu. The council was in agreement, and the divine plan was set into action. So now, let us turn to the human world, where the action of our story will take place. There was once a city called Ayodhya. She was as beautiful as a bride on her wedding day. A wide moat and tall walls protected her from enemies. All around her grew gardens and orchards. Her streets were broad and straight. Even the houses of the ordinary people were well built and comfortable. The water tasted as sweet as the juice of sugarcane. The rice was scented with saffron. Ayodhya. Where flowers fall like soft rain from the sky. Ayodhya. Where rivers run like children through the park. Ayodhya. Where maidens move like moonbeams in the eye. Ayodhya. Where rubies burn like fireflies in the dark. Ayodhya. Where the wildest weather is but a gentle breeze. Ayodhya. Where monkeys sing like songbirds in the trees. 
Ayodhya. This lovely city was ruled by King Dashratha, who was wise, just, and dedicated to holy law, known as Dhamma. He was loved by his family and by all the people of Ayodhya. This blessed king had but one sorrow. None of his three wives had borne him a son. He consulted the wisest sages about what to do to resolve this problem. After listening to what they had to say, he decided upon a sacred rite known as a yanga, in which a horse is sacrificed to the gods. The day of the yanga was set in the calendar. Dashrathra invited kings, holy men and nobles from all over the world to witness the ceremony. For weeks the workers of Ayodhya built pavilions, stables and houses to accommodate the visitors. The pillars were festooned with wonderful carvings, the walls draped in tapestries and the floors covered with fine carpets. All were supplied with food and drink and entertained with music and dancing. Day after day, the priests performed sacred rites. Then came the day of the ceremony. Kosalia was the king's first and most revered wife. The high priest ruled that she must perform the sacrifice. So the queen wielded the sword and struck the horse with three blows. Later that evening, when the king was alone in the temple, he stood before a sacred fire and roasted some of the horse meat for the gods to savour its sweet smell and taste. The flames danced while the wise king tranced until a fiery figure before him appeared, robed in red, with flaming head, with glowing skin and lion-like beard. His radiant, sun-like face was clearly not of the human race. His arms held out a golden cup, filled with the food on which the gods themselves sup. Then he spoke, in a voice as deep as a battle drum. Good King Dasrata, from the gods I come. This food I bring feeds the heavenly beings. You must give it to your lovely queens. And of this one instruction be aware, Queen Kusalia must drink the greater share. Soon your wives will bear the sons you crave. This is the gift that Lord Brahma gave. King Dashratha reached out and took the golden cup from the flickering figure of the flames. He did exactly as he was told, feeding the divine food to his wives, spooning it into their mouths and he gave the largest part to Queen Kusalia, his first and most revered wife. When he had finished feeding the divine food to his wives, he was happier than a poor man who has suddenly come into money. Nine months later, four sons were born to him. Queen Kusalia gave birth to Rama. Never had the world seen such a beautiful human being. His face was like the moon on an unclouded night. As he grew into a boy, his talent shone like stars. He could shoot the keenest arrow. He could ride the fastest elephant. It was his joy to perform his father's will. Above all, he was wise, just and steeped in Dhamma. Queen Sumitra bore two sons, Lakshmana was devoted to his half-brother, Rama, and followed him like his shadow. Shatrugna was his twin, also just and brave. And the youngest queen, Kaiki, the favourite of King Dashratha, gave birth to the worthy Bharata. When the boys reached the age of thirteen, a sage came from the forests to speak to King Dashratha. His name was Vishwamitra, known as one of the holiest of men who had ever lived. King Dasratha 
honoured by a visit from such a famous holy man, knelt down and touched his feet. Wise sage, we are truly honoured by your visit. Name any request and I shall grant it. I do have a request, but before I ask it of you, let me explain my situation. It is highly unusual for me to come to the city and your magnificent palace. Normally, I live alone in the woods. My sole purpose is to perform sacred rites that please the gods and bring harmony to the universe. I have lived like this for many years, but nowadays, as I perform my mantra, I am harassed by rakshasas that fly at my head and fling dirt and blood at me. My request is this. Lend me Rama, your oldest son, that he may fight and defeat these evil fiends. Oh, ask for anything, but not this. My lotus-eyed child is not old enough for war. Let him stay at home and play with his toys. I shall send an army of ten thousand men to slay those noxious demons. Did you lie when you said you would grant me any favour I asked? I, 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 I did not lie, but Rama is my, my favourite son. I, I cannot allow you to take the apple of my eye. You have stored up worth and virtue all your long life. Now with this deception you throw it all away. Oh, please, I beg of you, show mercy. Why are you afraid? Do you not know that I will not allow harm to come to Rama? I will instruct him in the use of celestial weapons, the very same used by the gods. And then I shall school him in secret mantras to protect his body. The king almost fainted with grief at the thought of losing his son. However, he consulted his priests and holy men, and they advised him not to deny Vishwamitra his request. And so finally, he summoned Rama and his brother Lakshmana and gave them instructions to leave for the forest with Vishwamitra and to obey his every instruction. The great sage set out on the road, followed by the two boys with their bows in their hands. They looked like a three-headed cobra as they marched together, in time to the drumbeat of the gods on high. When they had gone a few miles, they came to the meeting point of two great rivers. Vishwamitra spoke softly to lotus-eyed Rama. Dear boy, stop for a while and drink from the waters. And while we are resting... I shall give you two mantras, Bala and Atibala. When you have mastered these mantras, you shall have no equal for beauty, strength, skill or wisdom. You will never feel tired, for Bala and Atibala are the mothers of all wisdom. Then Rama purified himself by drinking the water and learned the spells from Vishumitra who had discovered them through many years of contemplation. When he had received these mantras, Rama shone like the sun. The next day, after performing their morning prayers and rituals, they crossed the river in a boat. Eventually, they reached the edge of a dark forest. Rama turned to the great sage and asked, what is this forbidding forest? It is filled with the strange screeching sounds and the cries of wild beasts, tigers, bears and wolves. And Vishwamitra replied by relating the story of the Rakshasa who roamed the forest. Her name was Tataka. Her father had been king of the water spirits. She grew up to be tall and beautiful with the strength of a hundred elephants. She married a good man and had two sons. After her husband died, she fell in love with a wise rishi called Augustia. But he would have nothing to do with her. His rejection drove her mad and she began to taunt and disturb the rishi every time he went into deep meditation so that he could not carry out his rituals. In a fit of anger, 
Agastya cursed Atika and her sons, turning them into man-eating rakshasas. Vishwamitra ended the story by saying, And now the only man alive who is strong enough to kill this Tataka is you, Rama. But great one, how can I kill a woman? Have no mercy, even though she is a woman, because her heart is evil and she possesses great strength. Think only of this. Her death will bring greater harmony to the world. In Ayodhya, my father told me to follow all your commands without hesitation. I shall do as you say out of respect for my father's words and for you who are wise and holy. After this, the sage and the two boys continued into the forest until they came to a clearing where Vishwamitra told Rama that he must make a sound to attract Tataka, the evil Rakshasa. Rama twanged the string of his bow, making a humming sound that resounded through the trees, and soon Tataka appeared. Her face was hideous with rage, and she was dancing, hissing, spitting and flapping her feathered arms. Lakshmana, have you ever seen such an evil being? said Rama to his brother. But horrid as she is, I do not want to kill her, as she is a woman. See, I shall shoot off her ears and the tip of her nose to send her back to where she came from. But as he spoke, Dadiga began to hurl a shower of stones at the two brothers. This roused Rama's anger, and he lifted his bow to take aim. Dadiga charged him. Her heels kicking up a cloud of dark dust, her lungs letting out a piercing cry. Rama loosened his arrow at her. It struck her in the chest, and in that instant, she dropped to the ground. The sound of her dreadful voice ceased, and the forest fell silent. The gods looked down from heaven and saw Tataka lying lifeless on the ground. Then they rejoiced, and Vishwamitra kissed Rama on the head, saying, Bless you, tiger among men, I am pleased with you. That evening, Vishwamitra gave Rama a magnificent reward for his valour. He presented him with weapons that are normally wielded by gods and demons. He gave him shining swords, lances and maces, and magical projectiles including discuses and spears. And with these arms, Rama was the greatest soldier on earth. The following day, they continued their journey until they came to a lovely place filled with deer and sweet singing birds known as the ashram of the perfected being. Here the great sage went into a deep state of meditation while the two princes stood guard over the ashram for six days and nights without sleep. At the end of the sixth night, the sky was filled with a terrible screeching sound. The sons of Tataka, Maricha and Subahu came hurtling out of the sky, shooting blood at the princes. When this happened, Rama turned to his brother saying, now I shall scatter these evil flesh-eating rakshasas like the wind scatters clouds in the sky. And then he fired a holy weapon into the breast of Maricha, who dropped to the ground, still writhing and yet alive. See, he is not dead yet, said Rama, who then chose a yet more powerful weapon to finish him off. Tataka's other son, Subahu, was now more enraged than ever. But Rama fired at him and his body whirled around and was flung into the sea some 800 miles away. Then a dark cloud of yet more rakshasas flew in for the attack. The 
noble princes Rama and Lakshmana fought them off until all evil demons were dead. When Vishwamitra finished his holy rituals, he learned of what Rama and his brother had accomplished and was delighted. He told them, You have followed your father's orders and completed your task. Now this ashram is truly perfected. Tomorrow, I shall head off on a journey to visit King Janaka in the Himalayan mountains. He possesses a divine bow. Any prince who can string and fire the bow shall win the hand in marriage of his daughter, Princess Sita. Will you accompany me on this journey and try your luck with this bow? And of course, the two boys agreed to follow the wise Rishi. And that was the first part of our version of the Ramayana. It was adapted by Bertie and featured the voices of Tom Florence and Bertie. The original was written in ancient Sanskrit and you might be interested in knowing a smattering of Sanskrit words. For example, a wise man in Sanskrit is a Rishi. Perhaps you've heard... Britain's new Prime Minister is called Rishi Sunak. His first name means a sage or a wise man. A related word is a guru who is a teacher. And as you heard in the story, a rakshasa is a demon or a monster. And before I go, I'd just like to give a special shout out to our listener, Charlotte Grace from Cornwall, who recently turned eight years old. To all our listeners, you can support us on Patreon or via PayPal. Just go to storynoi.com to find the links. And if you like stories of a spiritual nature, we are starting a new podcast called Relaxivity. It's a little more grown up than Story Nori and ideal for adults and teenagers. That's relaxivity in all good podcast apps or in the web at relaxivity.app. For now, from me, Jana, at storynori.com. Bye for now. The Halloween Skeleton in the closet. Dedicated to Mila, who supports Story Nori on Patreon. Hello, this is Jana. And I'm back with a new episode from our series about the haunted Dutch hotel. We began this series a year ago, in the run-up to Halloween. If you've been following, you will know that the Jones family managed the Dutch Hotel. There are all sorts of strange apparitions that might be ghosts, or might be time travellers. One member of the family is steadfastly sceptical about all things supernatural. And that is the mother, Angeliki. In this episode, we find out why the Halloween skeleton in the closet. It was October and of course the main event in the Dutch hotel's calendar was Halloween. The staff were planning a fancy dress ball with or without any real ghosts. But in the personal life of the Jones family who managed the hotel, the biggest event on the horizon was the arrival of Angeliki's mother from Cyprus. She was planning a two-week stay. Just in time for Halloween. Alan remarked dryly. And as soon as he had muttered the words, he was relieved that his wife had not heard them. The truth was, Alan didn't mind his mother-in-law too much. It was just that she could be a little bit domineering. On her previous visit, Alan had been growing a beard. Eleni... That was her name, 
chided him every day, saying, What? Are you becoming a priest? Fortunately, Alan could smile about Eleni and her eccentric views. But what he found harder to bear was when Angeliki and her mother started quarrelling. Sometimes the shouting got so loud that he had to go out to the pub for some peace and quiet. That was in the old days when they were in the small Muse house. Now they had moved into the Dutch hotel, he could find a quiet corner of the property because it had 66 rooms. When Eleni arrived at Heathrow Airport, Alan was there to collect her. He was pleasantly surprised with her warm greeting and her maternal kisses on either cheek, followed by a hearty slap on the back. For a moment, he hoped that his mother-in-law was a reformed woman. But then she prodded him in the stomach and remarked, Leaky's been feeding you well, I see. Look at that tummy. And I thank the Lord that you finally took my advice and cut off that dreadful beard. Hmm, that didn't last long. He took her bags, which were extra heavy, and led the way to the Rolls Royce in the car park. Alan, when are you going to get rid of that old car? She asked. But he pretended not to notice. Once he was in the driving seat, he reached for his AirPod phones and plugged them into each ear. He selected his favourite 1970s playlist and drove blissfully. At least Eleni was suitably impressed when they arrived at the Dutch hotel. She didn't say so, but Alan could tell by the way she was looking around the fluted columns, marble floors and works of art. Angeliki met her mother with hugs and kisses before showing her to her suite of rooms, which was bigger than a whole floor of the Muse house. What's this? It's a bath or a swimming pool? She asked. You want me to drown in it? The kids were slightly afraid of their nana because she was always telling them off. But they also liked the fact that she gave them gifts of money when she arrived, even if the notes were in euros. Not only that, but she always bought boxes of Turkish delight. Only the kids were ticked off for calling them Turkish, because Nana was very patriotic about them being made in the Greek part of Cyprus. Even before she had any time to rest, Eleni wanted to cook supper. The family had a kitchen in their apartment, but they usually ordered food from the hotel. After all, the chef was one of the best in London, with a Michelin star, and anything they ordered was free, because they managed the hotel. Eleni couldn't resist scolding Alan, saying that he should not feed his family on takeaway food. Too much salt and preservatives, you know, she chided. No wonder you are getting so chubby. And so she sent Alan out to buy the ingredients for Greek salad and moussaka. She supplied the olive oil herself. Now Alan understood why her luggage was so heavy. She had brought four large canisters of extra virgin olive oil. Soon she was busy at the stove. Even Alan, who considered himself to be a dab hand at cooking, could not deny Eleni's food was excellent. While they were enjoying their delicious meal, Yogi asked, Nana, what are you doing for Halloween? I have no plans, dear, she said. I just wondered because Dad said you got here just in time for Halloween, said Yogi. Angeliki gave her husband a fierce glare across the table and he quickly averted his eyes. Eleni went about explaining that it hadn't been Halloween that had brought her to London in October. In the years when she had lived in North London, bringing up the family, autumn had always been her favourite season, because the trees turned a beautiful shade of gold. Nana, you've come to the right place at the right time, because our hotel's haunted. And Halloween is going to be extra spooky, added Yogi excitedly. Haunted, you say? You sound just like your mother. She's extra superstitious, you know. No, I'm not, protested Angeliki. I don't believe in any of that nonsense. And I'm fed up telling the kids not to believe in ghosts. Is that right, Leaky? You're different now, Eleni asked, looking her daughter in the eye. 
She then recounted how terrified of ghosts her daughter used to be, and how she would scream at the top of her lungs after a bad nightmare. Have you forgotten rushing into our room in the middle of the night, crying about ghosts, creeping about your room? I had to beg the priest to come, but that made you even more crazy. Mama, that's not true. Please stop telling stories," exclaimed Angeliki, who was now very agitated. But her mother seemed oblivious to her daughter's frowning face. She just went on. Oh, the stories I could tell the kids about when you were little! Remember the fortune teller? Oh, please don't! Begged Angeliki now with her head in her hands. Eleni turned to the kids and began disclosing their mother's secrets. When she was about twelve years old, living in Finchley, her best friend was a neighbour whose name was Eliza, a very strange girl. No, Mama, please stop. But Eleni took no notice. Eliza called herself a goth. Her long, pitch black hair went all the way down to her waist. It wasn't that long, Ma. It grew until it reached below her knees. You know, her face was as white as my wedding dress. She continued, and told them how easily Eliza could have passed as a ghost. Eliza, she said, had been a very bad influence on Angeliki, because she believed superstitious nonsense. And one particular Halloween, she dragged her to see a fortune teller at the fairground. It was after that, the worst nightmares began. There was no sleep in our house until Christmas. I tell you, enough! <laughs> Screeched Angeliki, standing up and banging the table. I said, "Stop it, Mama! You exaggerate everything a thousand times over." I had the occasional nightmare. That's all. It's a perfectly normal thing to happen while you're growing up. Okay, if you say so, dear," sighed her mother, who held her peace for the rest of the supper. But of course, the kids were very intrigued about everything that had been said, and wanted to know the rest of the story. It might explain why their mother was so against superstition and believing in ghosts, even when they were living in a hotel with actual apparitions that appeared all the time. The next day, Yogi begged his nana to tell the rest of the story about their mother and the fortune teller, but she was no longer in a talkative mood. You'll have to ask her yourself about the skeleton in her closet," she said. She has made me take an oath of secrecy. You mean Mum has got an actual skeleton? Eleni shook her head and refused to say anything more on the subject. Later that day, his sister Nafsi got Yogi up to speed, explaining that the skeleton in the closet was just a figure of speech. Yogi knew that if he asked his mother any uncomfortable questions, she would respond by yelling at him to do his homework or tidy his room. So he did not bother trying. But his sister Nafsi was more subtle. When she was alone with her mother in the living room, she said, "Mum, I sometimes have nightmares. They are really scary. How did you get over yours? Well, by using healthy thinking and good psychology," said her mother. "What do you mean by that? Can you explain?" Nafsi asked craftily. Okay, well, this is what really happened to me when I was young," said her mother. "Yep, it's true that my friend Eliza introduced me to a fortune teller, but it wasn't at a fairground. We visited her flat, which was above a shop on the high street. That was my first mistake. I should never have agreed to go there without telling my parents. Anyway, she dealt us tarot cards." Which are used for fortune telling. Oh, she didn't deal you the death card, did she? Asked Nafsi, who thought she could see where the story was heading. No, in a way, it was worse. She pulled out a card called "The Fork in the Road." She said it meant that my life could go in one of two directions, and it was all up to me. 
If I could dream positive dreams, they would all come true. But if I had bad dreams, they would also come true. And here's the really heavy part. Not just for me, but for all of the world. How could that be? Nafsi was intrigued. Well, she said we each live in our own dimension and our thoughts come true at a particular stage in our life. The fork in the road card meant that I was at the special stage where my dreams would determine all the world's destiny. Wow, that's insane! I knew it was crazy, but I couldn't get the idea out of my head. And Eliza made it worse. On the way home, she told me that I must have positive dreams or else I, and I alone, would be responsible for everything bad that happened in the world. I was only 12. It was too much for me. I couldn't control my dreams. And I started to see every plague, pestilence and war that anyone could imagine. Eventually, it ended with psychopathic aliens invading the world. I couldn't sleep for weeks on end. I was exhausted and miserable and falling behind at school. So how did you cure yourself? asked Nafsi. Well, fortunately, there was this teacher at school who was interested in hypnosis and psychology. He noticed that I was in a bad way. So we used to have talks about all that I was going through. He gave me some of the best advice I've ever had. He told me to think of something positive and write it out 15 times a day. That way, it would come true. But isn't that a sort of magic? You might think so, but he said not. He said my subconscious would start to notice opportunities and I would release positive energy from my brain. I would see the world in a better light and make good luck for myself. And did it work? asked Nafsi. Oh, yes. The most remarkable thing started to happen to me. I wrote down every day that there will be peace in the world. And you know what happened? When Mr Reagan was President of the United States, he met Mr Gorbachev, who was president of the Soviet Union. And they agreed to be friends and not bomb each other. But that can't have been you, Mum, laughed Nafsi. Probably not. But at least it felt good and I slept better. So next I tried writing. I will get A's in all my exams 15 times a day. Of course, I started working harder on my homework and I was less tired. So it wasn't all just some supernatural force. But when my results came through, every result was A. That's incredible, smiled Nafsi. I'm going to try it too. You mustn't do it instead of working hard for your goals, added her mum. You have to put the effort in too. But it will help you achieve the impossible. I'm not superstitious but I do believe that you can change your own luck and your own world. You have to programme your brain to do it. That's all. That's fantastic, Mum, said Nafsi. And she began to think about all the things she would like to achieve. Her important exams were not due for another two years, so she wanted to think of something else. I know, she thought. I want to pass my grade eight at piano. As she was still struggling with grade two, this was a suitably ambitious test for writing out an affirmation 15 times a day. And when she told Yogi, he was excited too. What do you want to achieve? asked his sister. Oh, that's easy. We're going to have the best Halloween ever. But it's only in two days time. Well, if mum's magic spell doesn't work fast, It's probably not going to work at all, he declared. It isn't magic. It's good mental health, insisted Nafsi. Oh, whatever. Yogi diligently wrote out. We're going to have the best Halloween ever at the Dutch Hotel. 
15 times and his labours paid off. On the night of the party, Dad allowed the kids to stay up until after midnight so that they could see him play the saxophone with a jazz band that he had hired. He was dressed in a black boiler suit with a luminous skeleton painted on it. The guests were all in good spirits, dressed up as ghouls, vampires and characters from their favourite horror movies. The kids were hoping to see some of their ghostly friends and they were not disappointed. Mr. Lucas and Mr. Levi, the Dutch twins who had founded the hotel 200 years ago, were there and they brought their employees, Maria and Mr. Cooper, to the 21st century for the party. But the strangest thing happened when Yogi ran over to say, Trick or treat! They just vanished. And so when the ghosts appeared again 10 minutes later, the kids resisted the temptation to approach them. But there was another ghost who caused even more of a stir. His name was Mackenzie, an old butler from years gone by, who looked about a hundred years old. He kept appearing in a chair next to Eleni and disappearing again a few minutes later. Eleni, who was dressed as the Wicked Witch of the West, grew more and more impatient with him and said, You don't fool me with your trick or treating? The fourth time he appeared, he leant over to say something in her ear. That was the final straw, so she stood up and gave him a good beating with her handbag. This caused the kids a great deal of laughter, especially as Mackenzie's costume split in half, revealing the old butler in his underpants. Both the kids saw what really happened, but the other guests could only see an old witch thrashing a chair with her handbag and shouting, you should know better at your age! All in all, the Halloween party was enjoyed by everyone. The faithful chef put on a magnificent feast of ghoulish but delicious food, fit only for Alan. And Alan's solo was a success. And although the family missed Delaney when she flew back to Cyprus in November, they were also quite relieved. I'm delighted to dedicate this Halloween episode of the Dutch Hotel to Mila, whose family kindly supports Story Nori on Patreon. Her mother, Anna, writes, Thank you so much for recording these amazing stories. Our daughter Mila is obsessed with them and has been listening to them on repeat. Her favourites are definitely the Wicked Uncle School Days and the Ungolden Fish. She also loves the Dutch Hotel. Thank you so much, Mila, for supporting us on Patreon. And to all our listeners, have the best Halloween ever. Katie's Botanical Birthday Hello, this is Natasha. And I'm happy to be back on Story Nori. I'm here with a story about Katie the Witch.